Hi, it's Lawrence Krauss. I wanted to uh, apologize to some of you because today I'm going to do a little math again because I wanted to follow up on uh, and finish up what I was talking about yesterday. There were so many uh, questions that I thought it would be worth continuing that rather than having a gap. I promise, in fact, that tomorrow we'll do something quite different, a demonstration, no math. Uh, but today, for those of you who um, find the math a little challenging, there'll be less of it, but I'll use a little bit today and bear with me. All I can say is that um, while that may be a hindrance to you, at, at least uh, um, this is a constraint on me because now, unlike the normal social distancing and social isolation where I can wear the same hoodie every single day and no one sees it, I feel obliged to change my, uh, my sweater or hoodie each day for you. So in any case, what I wanted to talk about was that was the mystery that I described at the end of the uh, end, end of the last uh, five minute video last time. And I drew, I decided to draw, redraw that picture uh, that really had the content that I derived for you last time, which, um, which here's, here's the density of the universe, of the different things in the universe, as a function of the size of the universe as it increases. And, uh, and I remind you that, that the matter density is some number here, and the matter density falls as 1 over the volume, or 1 over the cube of the radius, as the universe grows. The radiation density, however, goes as 1 over the fourth power of the radius, so it falls faster. It's less now by a factor of 100,000 compared to matter. And if you work backwards, when the universe was 100,000th its current size, about the time it was somewhere between 100 and 1,000 years old, uh, those two crossed, and for all times before that, radiation dominated the energy density of the universe, and that's why we have a hot early Big Bang. And then I told you we discovered this weird thing called dark energy, which appears to have a constant energy density, and it's a factor of three times the energy density of matter. It's the dominant energy density in the universe today, and the biggest mystery in physics, as I'll talk about. Now, I talked about a few of the things that were weird about it, but one was thinking about the total energy in any given volume. The total energy in any given volume is the energy density times the volume. But the volume goes as r cubed, and if the energy density of dark energy remains constant, then the energy, total energy in any volume as the volume grows uh, in empty space, in dark energy, grows as the cube of the radius. How can the energy grow? That appears to violate one of the fundamental tenets of, of physics that people s sometimes remember from high school, the conservation of energy. How can empty space get more and more energy as the size of empty space grows? Well, that one of the, of the problems is one we can sort of understand. And all you have to remember is that, um, oh, I meant to bring the balloon that I, um, that I blew up the very, for the very first uh, um, uh, five-minute video. When I blew up that balloon, of course, I was, I was applying pressure, and I was doing work on the balloon. When I push a heavy wheelbarrow, I'm doing work on that wheelbarrow, and it, and I, and it takes energy. I have to eat donuts afterwards or whatever to, to get the energy to do it again then, l later on. And so there's a, um, if I'm doing work by moving something, but with a pressure against it, there's a, there's a one equation from physics which says that the change in the energy of a system is, is basically minus the work done, and the work is the pressure I apply times the change in the volume. So the change in the energy is pressure times volume. I'm, I'm applying pressure and I'm increasing the volume. Now, how do we determine the pressure of something? Well, actually, the very famous physicist James Clerk Maxwell, many years ago, pointed out that if I have, say, a balloon and I have lots of, lots of atoms in it, the way they cause pressure is the atoms are bouncing off the surface of the balloon and constantly bouncing off and, and, causing, and producing a force on the surface of the balloon and, um, and as they bounce back and forth, they apply a pre produce a force, which effectively is a pressure. Now, he realized that the pressure, therefore, is going to be proportional to two things. It's going to be proportional to the velocity of the particles, because that determines their momentum. The faster they're moving, the more the momentum they can impart to the walls of the balloon. But also, if they're moving faster, then they bounce against the balloon 
more times every second. So there were two factors of velocity, and he basically said the pressure is something like the average velocity squared of particles hitting the surface of the balloon. There were other constants here, but they don't really matter for us. Now, this is, we're doing a, uh, the expansion of the universe, we're really talking about relativity, and we're really comparing everything to the speed of light. And we can say, okay, what is the pressure due to just matter that's just sitting around, like galaxies that are at rest more or less in the expansion? Well, their average velocity is about zero. They're not moving. That means their pressure that they're exerting on the expanding universe is roughly zero. And that means they're not doing any work on the expanding universe, so the change in energy of matter in any volume is zero. What does that mean? Well, that we can see that because the density falls as one over the volume. The density times the volume in that case, the density times the volume is a constant. Because one of them is going down as one over r cubed, and one of them is going up as r cubed. So for matter, we can understand that it's not doing work on the expansion, and that's why it goes down as 1 over r cubed. Now, particles of light, photons, are moving at the speed of light. And in the units where they say the speed of light is 1, they're moving at unit, unit velocity 1. But the point is they're, they're moving very fast, and photons, therefore, have a pressure, and radiation is doing work on the expanding universe. And that explains why there's this extra power of R. Because the density of these things is going down not as 1 over R cubed, but 1 over R to the fourth. And that's because radiation is exerting a pressure on space as it causes it to expand. And the pressure is positive, so that and as the volume increases, this quantity is negative. The energy in any volume decreases. And that causes radiation to fall more quickly than matter due to its radiation pressure. So we can understand these two things we derived yesterday a different way. Radiation produces pressure, matter uh, doesn't. Now we can understand dark energy. Because dark energy, and this is the one thing you'll have to take on, 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 um, on faith. I'm going to do a, a mathematical appendix for the physics wizards um, uh, later today. But the point is, we, you can show that if you put energy in empty space, then it is a fact, and it's required by relativity, that the energy density of the, the, the energy in empty space is equal to minus its pressure. Namely, the pressure due to energy in empty space is negative. And if the pressure is negative, then from this, this becomes positive. And that means that the total energy in empty space can grow. But you're not violating energy conservation because the, what you're doing is you're finding that space itself is actually doing work on the volume. The expansion of space is actually doing work on empty space in that volume because the pressure of, of the energy in empty space is negative. That's what's so weird. The pressure of, of, of a energy deposit in empty space has to be negative, and that means space itself is doing work as uh, on, or rather the expansion of the universe is doing work on space and dumping energy into space, and therefore it's okay that the total energy in empty space is increasing. It doesn't violate energy, any, anything having to do with the conservation of energy. It's weird, but not that weird. So that's how we can understand this, the fact that ener dark energy has negative pressure. And that, as I say, is not something mysterious. We can actually show it using the mathematics of general relativity and for some of you, I'll, do, I'll show you that in an appendix later. But what I did want to end with are the two things that are weird. First of all, the fact that this dark energy is constant. Namely, that, that there is an energy in empty space. As I said, that's weird because while we can describe mathematically that energy, how did it get there? And we don't have the slightest answer. We do not know why empty space has the energy it has and that is certainly one of the biggest mysteries in physics. But there's another mystery that I didn't mention yesterday. If you look at this, the energy of empty space is within a factor of three of the energy of matter today. But that's the only time in the history of the universe. In the far future, the energy density of matter will be much less than the energy density of empty space. 
In the past, it was far greater. The mystery is, why are we living at this random time in the history of the universe when those two numbers are almost the same? And once again, we don't have an answer, and that's driven physicists kind of crazy. But one thing I should point out is, this constant energy density in empty space is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate, to speed up. That's what was discovered a bunch of years ago when we were looking at supernovae, that the universe was accelerating, the expansion was accelerating. But if you go back in time, there was a time when the energy density in empty space was less than the energy density of matter, and the universe, for all earlier times than this, should have been slowing down. In fact, the observers who've been looking at supernovae about, about 13 years ago or so discovered that if they look back in time, they could find a time when the universe was decelerating and they could actually see the time when the universe started accelerating. About five billion years ago is when the universe started accelerating. I actually organized the meeting where I brought some of the major cosmologists in the world together and I got a young assistant professor who was working on this, a guy named Adam Reese, to come and talk about it. And this time where something goes from decelerating to accelerating has a name in classical mechanics. It's called a jerk. And when he, he gave his result, I wanted to encourage a young person to be able to give the talk, and reporters were there, and the front page of the New York Times had a picture of Adam Reese, and it said, Cosmic Jerk Discovered. <laughs> and that's always made me laugh. Of course, Adam, in, in some sense, had the last laugh because the group that he was part of, he won the Nobel Prize for, for this work along with others, so uh, he didn't mind that. In any case, that's all for today. Tomorrow, I promise, a demonstration. Take care.